Discipline, consistency, patience, humility, character, integrity. <sighs> Exciting. All right, so today, lecture number seven of Ratliff University. We will be discussing Make Your Bed by Admiral William McRaven. So I think you can guess what the homework assignment is going to be. It's going to be <laughs> um, but I thought the most important thing that I would start with is let me tell you something because that's the premise of this. It seems very simple, very redundant. You're wondering why would you include this in the most prestigious university there is or ever will be, and I'll tell you. I watched a video. It was by Luke Belmar, and. He was asking the guests on it, it was like on a podcast, he said, do you want to be a millionaire? And the guy said, yeah, yeah, I do. He's like, then do 50 push-ups. And I left my watch in my car. <laughs> you don't get to see it. Um, and he was like, do 50 push-ups. And the guy was like, I don't understand how that relates to, and he said, the task in itself is irrelevant. The discipline to perform the task, the consistency to repeat the task, that's everything. And what I find with success and why it's so important to reiterate it in this book, and this is how I want to start this lecture, is it's a quote from Greg Plitt. He said, success, it's the character, is the little things you do day in and day out when no one's watching. That is your character. That's integrity. It's, he said, success isn't a light switch that goes on and off when someone's fucking watching. It's constant, right? And Today, in today's world, I think character and integrity have to be the two most non-existent virtues to be prevalent in the society today. As in, when you see people walk around in the complete absence of class, of character, of merits, of integrity, it screams, it shouts, it shows. And it's because people shortcut and neglect and cut corners when no one's watching. And the little things. Something as simple as doing 50 push-ups, something as simple as making your bed, something as simple as tracking your expenses for the day, something as simple as tracking your calories for the day, something as simple as getting up when you say you're gonna get up. If you end your, I end my showers on the coldest setting, making my bed, going to the gym, doing my cardio, the promise is unkept, the neglect that stacks, I think the most important thing that you can do, and this is actually, I learned this from Ed Milet, it's the definition of competence. And all competence, as you have to understand, is a self-trust system. And so when people don't have a lot of confidence, what it reflects is a plethora, history, archive of promises unkept. As in, when you say, this is the time I'm gonna get up, these are the meals that I'm gonna eat, this is the effort that I'm gonna put into my training, these are the amount of outreaches, cold calls, prospecting, this is the amount of calls that I'm gonna do, emails I'm gonna send, whatever the task is, or make my bed. All of the neglect, all of the places where you cut corners, all where you know that you could have done but didn't, it's evident in your confidence because your confidence is directly correlated to the level of trust you have within yourself. So when you see someone who's very, very confident of a person, you can fake it for a while, right? You can be a good actor, but when it's your default, it reflects someone who has a consistent habit, a consistent discipline of keeping promises, the small ones and the big ones, but the small ones add up to the big ones that they make to themselves. And that's the most important part of the, this book is something as seemingly insignificant as making your bed. And another virtue that's non-existent is humility. And the idea of doing 50 push-ups to be a millionaire, the idea of making your bed, the idea of losing one pound, Jordan Peter said it very well. And we're gonna discuss his two books in a later lecture to come. I have them both, I'm very excited about it. And one of them I think, in terms of his 12 rules for life, I believe is make your bed. I believe that's one of them. Or at least clean your room, which we'll get into in this lecture. But, where I lost my train of thought, but the, what were we talking about? <laughs> oh, e uh, humility and ego. Ego is prevalent, humility non-existent. And the reason is Jordan Peterson said it perfectly. He said, people won't reduce themselves 
to complete the completion of a task because they deem it too less than, too little for them. They, they deem themselves too good to do that task. And he said, but people don't understand the way progression works. It's not linear, it's exponential. So he said, it doesn't matter how small that first step is because your progression will look like this, not linear, exponential, because it's, it's almost becomes like a doubles game. And that's the definition of an upward spiral. It's like the person who makes his bed, the person who also reads, the person who also meditates, the person who also goes to the gym, the person who also puts effort into watering his relationship, into his garden, into the social media garbage consumption that he does not consume. All of these tiny little wins, these tiny little victories, they add up and you build momentum and you gain confidence and then you start taking more action and then you get in better results and then that solidifies your belief. And then you tap into more of your potential, you take more action, you get even better results. It's an upward spiral. But when you neglect the little things, when you deem yourself too good to lose one pound, how are we gonna get to you losing 100 pounds? See, the problem is, and I know this firsthand from coaching people in their fitness transformations, I'm learning this personally in terms of my financial transformation, is the arrogance to not humble yourself or when you've done something one way your entire life and then you're asking for help and then you insist on not doing what the person is suggesting and that you're going to continue doing the same shit you've been doing that has gotten you the results you now yield that you, that is now your reality that's the level of arrogance in the world that we live in today. And I, I've, I've literally had this first time where a client will tell me all of their habits. I'll explain to them, this is what, that, what you did in terms of them being in a thousand calorie deficit, in terms of them doing no protein, doing three hours of cardio a day. I'm like, your results, or sorry, your actions have yielded these results. Slowing your own metabolism, your body holding on to any extra stored body fat, your body prolonging its own life in the hopes that you'll soon find access to food because it thinks it's dying. And then you, you encourage them to increase their calories, to reduce their cardio, to increase their weight training. And they say, no, I'm going to keep doing what I've been doing. The level of arrogance is mind bending because you have to ask yourself, right? The definition of psychotic behavior is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. Why would doing the same thing you've been doing that have gotten you the results you have now, why would continuing to do that yield anything different, right? But, and, and then it goes back to that old adage, right? If you want something you've never had before, you have to be willing to do something you've never done before. And same thing with weight loss. I've had people, I need to lose 100 pounds. Settle down. It didn't, and, and then they want it overnight. And it's like, no, no, this didn't happen overnight. It's not going to be undone overnight. We can't correct 10 years of garbage training and eating habits overnight. That's a literally from a video by Greg Place. He said those exact words. But people with this instant gratification, get rich quick, I want to get out of the work. And that is the premise of this lecture today is you cannot get out of the work. And if you do the little things, if you do it when no one's watching, this quote by Greg Plitt, you'll be doing it when everyone's watching. The public victory that you see, that overnight success, that is the one show for a thousand private victories no one talks about. No one was up with you in the grind. No one was with you. No one gives a shit about you in your before, right? Everyone's there for the congratulations. No one cares. No one wants to be up with you at three, four, five in the morning. No one's there with you when you're growing your business, when it's getting no views, when you're putting in these 16 hour days with no monetary return people in their own best interest, they want to support a winning team. They want to wait for you at the finish line instead of be that day one, right? So it's very important. There's a really good quote that I'm really glad I remembered. It said, love those who saw you when you were invisible to everyone else. Very, very powerful. And again, it all ties into doing the work others won't behind closed doors when no one's watching so you can live a life others can't. All right, let's begin. I wanted to start this lecture with a story. When I was living in my car, I made my bed every day, my bed. As in, I had this warm fleece blanket, 
did you see the lights flicker? <laughs> I had a, I didn't even have a pillow. I would use like a hoodie and then I would use my towels because I slept in my car for 93 days before I got this apartment to pay off as much of the rat life debt as I possibly could. And yet I knew how you do something is how you do everything. So even in those dire times, even when my body was aching from that looming state of depression because it was just, I was so sick of my circumstances and my conditions and I hated it so much that I didn't want to get up in the morning to wake up at 3 a.m. to go to the gym, to then shower, to go drive to train a client and then go to work. And all of this grind, but to start your day with that first task completed, with the first promise kept of making my bed, even though it was the driver's seat of my car. There has, I haven't not made my bed in, without bullshit, it's probably been like a year, if not longer. When I'm in a hotel, I make my bed. When I've been homeless, I've made my bed. When I'm just, I don't like, there's a quote by Michael, Michael Jordan. He said, if you quit once, it, be, it becomes a habit. And so, if you neglect, if you shortcut, you're gonna see your self-image and self-confidence and self-respect, self-love diminish because you know what you did not do. You know where you neglected. You know where you cut it short. You know when you bullshitted. You know what you could have done and what you chose not to do, right? So I don't like to cultivate and develop that habit. And I remember something simple when I was in this apartment, I would let my dishes pile up and then it, there's this great book by Brian Tracy, Eat the Frog, and it's like do, it's the premise of the way to kill fear is to starve it of time. And when you don't do something and then it neglects and then you keep putting it off, putting it off, putting it off, eventually you just have to be like, dude, this is, this is bullshit. And it was like 30 minutes, like, it, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't in a freaking dump, but my sink was full of dishes and it took like 30 minutes, but my friend Ricardo, he left me a WhatsApp audio message. So I listened to it in perfect, you know, timing with, with, uh, doing my dishes. So I finally got that shit done and then I cleaned up my entire apartment. And then I, I felt so good because it was like 10 promises kept. I was like, I'm going to, you know, wet wipe all my counters, going to take all the trash, going to do my dishes, going to vacuum, going to do my laundry, going to put it all away. And... It's so interesting how, if you watch the movie Limitless with uh, the actor from The Hangover, I'm forgetting his name, Brian, Brian, Bradley Cooper. What is the first thing that he does when he takes that pill? He cleans up his room. He cleans his apartment. Because it's interesting how, in terms of clarity and chaos and why it's all reflective, your outer circumstances and conditions of your room, of your bed being made, of the trash in your car, it's all a reflection of here. So when you go into somebody's car and it is filthy, and you go into somebody's apartment and it's a pigsty, dude, they are not okay on the inside because the outer conditions of your apartment, the outer conditions of your car, the outer conditions of your body, it is all a reflection of that inner sanctimony, right? That inner tranquility, serenity, peace, equilibrium. It's a direct reflection. And you know this because when you're feeling great and you're like feeling motivated, what is the first thing that you do? You're like, I'm going to get my shit together. I'm going to clean up my life. Clean. The first thing you do is you clean up everything. You organize all your stuff. You get it pristine. Because when you know where everything is, right, then you have absolute clarity, peace of mind. Then because it, it, the best analogy is this. You throw a pebble into a pond, right? bunch of ripples, cannot see. But as soon as the water is calm, right? The water isn't muddied, it's calm. You can see through it, why? Clarity. It's the same thing in life. If you are in chaos up here, which is a direct, your outer circumstances will be a direct reflection of that. How can you look at your problems positively? How can you look at your problems and effortlessly come up with solutions, right? How can you tap into greater intelligence, insight, and creativity if your mind is full of clutter and garbage and waste and chaos? You can't, right? So all of these things to say, make your bed. <laughs> all right. So I wanted to start with page 103 to 104 because that's the whole... he. It's, it's very, very good. So the Admiral William McRaven, right? 
he was a um, Navy SEAL for over 30 years. And he breaks it down chapter by chapter with these incredible stories. And it's kind of, this reminded me of Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl in terms of someone experiencing tragedy and hardship and adversity, and yet having so much humility, having so much wisdom, having so much, um, there's no arrogance, there's just so much perspective that again, to not wallow in self-pity, right? To take ownership and responsibility for your life, to not allocate blame to anyone else for your circumstance or condition or event, but you. That's the recurring theme in this book. And one page that I wanted to read was a little passage because it's, this summarizes the entire book and then we can break it down line by line. So it's on page bottom 103, start at 104. Remember, start each day with a task completed. Find someone to help you through life. Respect everyone, know that life is not fair and that you will fail often, but if you take some risks, step up, step up when times are toughest, face down the bullies, lift up the downtrodden, and never, ever give up. If you do these things, then you can change your life for the better and maybe the world. And so I just wanted to break it down one by one, one by one, and I only have two pages of notes. I could do this lecture without looking at it because there's one homework assignment, it's to make your bed. But I wanna give you guys the most value out of each of these books from the university. So I take notes for you. <laughs> Number one, bed inspection. When he was in his Navy SEAL boot camp week, he said when his beds were being inspected, right, by the petty officers, this was the standard. That was it. There was no celebration. There was no high fives. There was no, oh my gosh, you did such a great job. There was no louding praise or adoration. He said, this was the standard. It was expected. And I put a question. I said, what is your standard? Do you have one? If your standard isn't the basic of making your bed, of going to the gym, of giving it your all, of doing your best effort, if that isn't your standard, get the fuck out of my class. It, you do not belong here. If your standard is bare minimum, the rhetoric of good enough, get the fuck out of here. You're wasting my time, you're wasting your time, right? If your standard is cutting the corners when no one's watching and yet putting on a mask when others are in the room, get the fuck out of this class. I don't want you. I don't want any part of you, right? I see it with my coworkers where a superior will come around and then they put on this facade. That's someone void of character and integrity. Someone who acts differently for a different title. The same person who treats the janitor with the same courtesy and respect as the superintendent, as the president of the company. That's someone with class, character, and integrity. The person who treats this person like shit and then puts on their angelic facade when their superior comes in, they can get fucked, right? And so I ask you, what is your standard? How do you carry yourself when no one's watching? What effort do you put in on those final reps in the gym when the camera's off and you're not posting it for a like on social media? If you do the job right, day in and day out when no one's watching, there's a quote by Greg Plitt. He said, I promise you'll be doing it when everyone's watching. And it's in the little things that you do, and I'm so glad that now I'm in the position to be that teacher that Greg Plitt once was for me in a world void of masculine role models or leadership. He had a video, he said, and I have it memorized because every time I think about saying the word good enough or cutting the corner, this is the exact video that comes to mind. And he said, when you're washing your car and you've put the hoses and the sponges and everything away and you come back and you notice a spot is still dirty, still missing. He said, what do you do? Do you pull the hoses back? Do you get all the water, get all the buckets? Do you do the job right? Or do you say good enough? When you're dusting your countertops, do you dust around the picture frame or do you pick the fucking picture frame up and do the job right? He said, do the job right, dust the whole fucking thing or don't do it at all. He said, that's the same person with his hand raised on the podium. Same motherfucker. How you hold yourself in the small things of life are the character winning blocks of the things we're remembered for the most, 
right? And it's that ideology that you have to believe in yourself enough to be the person now that others will remember you for later. If you don't have that standard of character, of integrity, of work ethic behind closed doors when no one's watching, you're never going to make it to your destination. If that's anything beyond a life of mediocrity, right? So it starts with what you do when no one's watching. Something like making your bed. I love that idea in this book. That was the standard that was expected. There was no fucking participation trophy or hooray for you doing what was expected of you, the bare minimum. But we live in a world today where there is no standard. There is no bare minimum. You go to the airport, people are in pajamas. You go to the gym, people are slamming their weights. We live in a world of people who, who were never beat, who had no discipline growing up, who were never told no, who were thrown the iPhone or iPad to solve the problems, and to, to stop the crying, to do all this. When I see a kid walking around shouting in front of their parent, I say, in what world would I have been able to do that? I would have gotten the shit kicked out of me if I dared, especially in public. And it, all it is is evident of people who were raised in a household with no discipline. It's not the kid's fault. It's shitty parenting. And so, and it's because the parents never hold their kid to a fucking standard. And we live in a world today with this OnlyFans shit where that's the standard, dude. It takes nothing to be beyond mediocre in this world today. It takes nothing to separate yourself as a man of class, work ethic, discipline, integrity, because there is no competition. How many people do you see on your social media waking up at 3, 4, 5 a.m.? How many people do you see killing it in their training? How many people do you see out of shape? How many people do you see posting drinking every fucking weekend? I've always asked myself, what the fuck are you celebrating? When you look at people and you look at their standard, you can do whatever you want in your life, right? If you want to drift, that's fine. If you don't want to have goals and targets, that's fine. If you want to pretend like you're stoked and you're happy about your situation in the absence of progression and you want to continue to kid yourself and justify and rationalize why it's okay that you quit, that's fine. I don't care. It's not my life, right? But if you want to be more, if you want more out of life, if you have one life to live and you don't want to settle for a life of fucking contentment and mediocrity, you have to hold yourself to a higher standard that no one else is going to hold for you. Not your family, not your spouse or significant other, not your parents, fucking no one. No one is going to be there at 3, 4, 5 a.m. saying, get the fuck up, dude, we have to kill it today. No one is going to invite that sense of urgency for you to show up, for you to kill it. Now, there's ways you can manipulate it by giving yourself, he says, don't paddle alone. Get a buddy, get a training partner, someone who's going to pick up the slack on the days that you're feeling down. That's amazing, right? I wish I had that. I wish when I was feeling down and out on the days I didn't want to show up, I had someone to drag my ass to the gym or to do this content. I don't have that yet, right? I have to have a why greater than me to force the accountability. I know, and I've always thought this, when there are the days that I didn't want to show up to, to work or to the gym, when your why is greater than yourself, you realize it's not your ability to, it's your responsibility to. I can't neglect, I can't half-ass, I can't not show up, because what example would I be setting for my son one day? What example would I be setting for the people who look up to me, right? What example would I be, and how could I ask anything from my friends or from my clients if I'm not willing to give it my all, if I'm not willing to show up on the days that I, I don't want to? Something that's always bothered me is hypocrisy. I hated when I had friends who made me feel like a fucking hypocrite for what I would say because I would entertain them as a part of my garden and ecosystem. People who would neglect, people who would say good enough, people who would cut corners. And then in my ignorance, in my delusion, in what world was I not going to become that, right? You're the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. And yet in my youth, I would surround myself with fucking losers, with drug addicts, with alcoholics, with these beta cuck males, right? Who don't establish any sort of leadership, decisiveness, authority, right? How would I not become that if that's what I was choosing to tolerate? That was my standard of friendships. Your friendships, your significant others, everything. It's a reflection of you and your standard. So important. So when you see someone who's a shitty person around another person, don't kid yourself, right? Don't kid yourself on the attributes that you're not seeing 
within that character because that is their standard, right? That's their standard of friend. That's their standard of partner, of significant other. They're a reflection of each other. It's what you tolerate. It's your standard. Raise your fucking standard. Next, discipline. Being true when the numbers are small, taking pride in the little things. What you do day in and day out when no one's watching, that's character. And I put cleaning in the order of your life versus chaos. And we talked about this room, car, body, etc. And then you set a partner to paddle with, right? I, there's a great video. It's called, I think it was uh, Simply Shredded. It was a five-part series by Greg Plitt. One of the best, most impactful videos I've ever seen on just getting your life together in every facet of your life. Not just cutting the fat out of your body, but cutting the fat out of your life. And one thing he talks about is having a partner, right? And the importance of a par partner is the idea of iron sharpening iron, right? Because your partner, when you're feeling down and out, when you say, I don't want to go, you're not going to be the guy that's going, and it's so interesting that I say this. I had a coworker who on the first day that her and some, one of her friends committed to going to the gym together, he no showed on her. And I said, you have to be such a piece of shit to be the guy on day one who's going to not show up when the other person is relying on you. Most of you watching this, you're not going to be that guy, right? You're not going to not go and not show up when someone else is relying on you. And when I have had clients in the past, I'll push the parent pain button. And it's like, when they don't want to go to the gym, I'll say something like, damn, would you consider yourself to be a decent mother to your daughter for someone who's unwilling to take care of themselves? And dude, you put that kind of fire underneath a woman, dude, it's exposing, but it's the truth. If you neglect to fill your cup, if you neglect to focus on yourself, you're fucking useless to the people you say you care about. Because if you're operating on fumes, an empty gas tank, and that's what you're pouring, that's what you're giving, it's selfish. Because you could be giving so much more. And it's your laziness, it's your lack of discipline, it's your lack of a fucking standard. But it's also a lack of accountability, right? Because if you had a picture of your daughter, right, every day in the forefront of your mind, then you wouldn't hit the snooze button on your alarm, right? And the issue is it takes a tragedy for people to get their shit together and to harbor any sort of gratitude and presence. People only harbor presence and gratitude in hindsight. It takes you going to the fucking doctor's office to get diagnosed with a medical condition, diabetes, heart attack, some scare. And then for the doctor to say, do you want to be there to walk your daughter down the aisle? For you to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to get my shit together. I'm going to take care of my diet. I'm going to start going to the gym, right? You don't have to learn something the hardest possible way, right? You can actively, proactively, preemptively take productive action, right? You don't have to be that guy who's going to be a piece of shit and do so much neglect and be a fat fuck, right? Until you get diabetes or a heart attack. It doesn't have to be that way. People, they learn the hard way or the hardest way. It takes decimation for people to say, oh, maybe I shouldn't do that, right? You can learn from other people's mistakes, right? You can fast track. That's the beauty of this university is I'm going to share all of my failures and all of my mistakes to hopefully save you time so you don't have to repeat it, right? You don't have to touch the hot stove to know that it's hot, right? If I tell you, hey, it's probably a good idea not to touch it, maybe you say, oh, maybe it's a good idea not to touch it, right? <laughs> But a partner to paddle with, dude, is a partner is so beneficial because they're going to hold you accountable. They can see where you neglect. They can call you out on your bullshit. And I'll tell you what a good partner does. A good partner doesn't fucking coddle you. A good partner doesn't give you sympathy dopamine. A good partner tells you to go fuck yourself on the days that you want to feel sorry for yourself. That's what a good partner does. And you could be that great partner, right? You could call that person out on the days that they're shortcutting, on the days that they're neglecting, on the days that they're sleeping in. You could drag their ass through a workout and they could have this greater high. Even though they came in with shitty energy, right? They could leave the workout exhausted, exhausting themselves physically, and then feel amazing from that endorphin rush, from the dopamine that they're getting from a task completed. Didn't mention that. When you complete a task, no matter how small, and you cross it off your list, you get a hit of dopamine. 
right? There's healthy ways to get dopamine and there's unhealthy ways. Scrolling on your phone, <laughs> shitty way to get your dopamine. Gambling, shitty way to get your dopamine. Drinking, shitty way to get your dopamine. Completing a task, right? Addicting, addicting addicting because then you'll get that upward spiral and you'll get that momentum and then the delayed gratification will increase because the short-term gratification is so undesirable when you start to see the progression of your physique when you start to see the progression of your finances when you start to see the progression of your network of your relationships right then all of the other things aren't as enticing you don't have fomo to not eat that piece of chocolate to not buy that latest iphone to not go out to this drinking party, right? None of all that shit goes to here when you start to gain momentum of progression of your goals, right? And so the beauty about having a partner is they're going to hold you to that higher standard. They're going to keep you recalibrated and focused on the fucking target on why we're doing this on the days where that why is cloudy, right? When you lose sight of the why, the adversity and the hardships and the struggles and the failures of today seem more overwhelming, more daunting, right? That's why it's very important to keep your why, the target, the goal, why you're doing this shit, why you get out of fucking bed in the morning in the constant forefront of your mind. Because then you're like, dude, this, not only is this tolerable, the quote from Viktor Frankl, and it's actually from Nietzsche, but he, he quotes it in the book Men's Search for Meaning. He said, a man with a strong enough why can endure nearly any how, right? But it's not even just that. It's not even just the ability to endure the how. You'll smile during it, right? You'll be so, you'll enjoy the process. This will be such an easy price to pay, pay that you'll be so willing to pay it. You'll be happy to pay this price, right? Because this is the payout. This is the cash out. This is what we're going to achieve as a result of the discipline, the daily disciplines that you do day in and day out when no one's watching, right? The delayed gratification, doing what others won't, I'll live a life others can't. Next, be indefatigable. That's the premise of this book. And I put weather your storm, prove yourself right, prove them wrong. And so there's a good quote, it's by Andrew Tate, he said, my unmatched perspicacity coupled with sheer indefatigability makes me a feared opponent in any realm of human endeavor. He said, that's all you need to be successful. Unmatched perspicacity. Be just observant. Perspicacity, the ability to perceive. Just look around the world around you. Be honest with your situation. Don't look at it worse than it is. Don't look at it better than it is. This is how much I weigh. This is my amount of debt. This is my bank balance. I'm going to look at the situation honestly. And then be honest with your habits, right? This is the time that I get up in the morning. These are how many times I'm snoozing my alarm. This is my how many tasks I neglect to complete. I don't make my bed. I don't do this. If you can diagnose your current snapshot of your life and you're honest with yourself and you have fucking humility to look yourself in the mirror and say, this is my current, not with to shit on yourself, right? There's a quote by Jim Rohn. He said, the reason why it's so hard for us to harbor self-love is because we're so hyper aware of our shortcomings, failures, and neglects. I understand that. So when you're very hyper cognizant of all the times that you fail and you shortcut and you neglect, it's very hard for you to have that self-confidence that we talked about because of all the unkept promises. I get that. But to the same token, it's very important that you have that confidence in yourself that this situation is temporary. I brought it full circle. I was, I was almost going to lose my train of thought, but then blah, got at the last second. If you knew, and this is why I force people who I coach and I do their transformations to smile in their before picture, because the only reason you wouldn't smile in your before is because you didn't believe in the after, right? But if you knew, if you knew you were going to look, you have your dream physique, if you knew you were going to be a millionaire, if you knew you were going to have your dream relationship, dream partner, then you wouldn't care about your present circumstance because you fucking know it's temporary. But if you do not believe in yourself and the journey you're about to embark on and the after and the achievement of the after, it's too fucking hard. When I, my credo of rat life, right? Anyone can escape. It starts with belief and the courage to pursue rat life. We're all going to make it. It starts with belief. That's the first line. If you don't have that belief, right? You won't be able to get the momentum needed 
to finish the journey, to make it to the finish line. It's too fucking hard. It's too uphill, right? You need that running start. And it's just belief and courage. It's just belief and courage to pursue, to take action, to fail, to try again. That's it. It's not a lack of resources. It's a lack of resourcefulness. I don't have the time. I don't have the money. I don't have the network. It's all bullshit. The only thing stopping you from achieving your goal is the bullshit story you keep telling yourself as to why you can't. The fact of the matter is it's not a priority because if it was, we wouldn't be having this conversation, right? So it's very important when you diagnose your current snapshot of your life, you have humility to say, I deserve the life I have right now. Hard for people to say that. I'm where I deserve to be. Hard for people to admit that, right? I deserve to be living in my car for my actions, consequences of my actions, of all the debt that I ensued, my fault. As soon as it's your fault, you give yourself power to remedy and change your situation. So important. So in terms of perspicacity, that's the first thing, right? And that comes with humility that people don't have. People are so afraid to take their shirt off and look at themselves in the mirror to hop on the scale. Most people are afraid to open up their fucking credit cards on their apps to see their current balance or their bank account to see their current checking account balance. If you don't look at your situation honestly for what it is and then begin to measure it, how the fuck do you plan to remedy it, to improve it? We cannot improve or perfect what we do not measure, right? So, and it's so important, and this is another thing in terms of finances. People don't talk about their finances. How are we going to remedy your financial predicament if we don't discuss it? I have this issue with family who get so squeamish and taboo and uncomfortable when I bring up money. But I'm just like, how are we going to plan? How are we going to grow? How are we going to improve if we don't even have the courage to have the dialogue? What the fuck are we talking about? Perspicacity number one, indefatigability is number two. Indefatigability, I cannot be fatigued. One of the first homework assignments was to remove the T word from your vocabulary, T-I-R-E-D. Why is, this, is that so important? Is because if that's your rhetoric, all you're doing is hypnosing, is hypnotizing yourself. I'm t, I'm t, I'm t. And so when you are, no fucking shit, no wonder. How could you not be, right? You know what I tell myself every time I hear that word? I say two things. I say, I'm indefatigable. And I say, I'm gorgeous. And the reason that I say that second one is because I struggle with my own self-image. When I look in the mirror, I see there's so many neglects, so many flaws, so many insecurities that I see. And so I'm conditioning myself to improve my self-image. When it comes to mind control, right? You have people who are going to make you feel less than. You already have that. Why would, by your own thoughts and your own rhetoric and narrative, why would you not be the hero of your story? Why would you choose to put yourself down, right? If you can have one person on your, in your corner as your cheerleader on your team, it's got to be you. And I'm not immune to that, man. And so those are my, I'm hypnotizing myself and saying it over and over, even if it's a lie, until I believe it. You're, I said it today when I was training at the gym. I looked myself in the mirror and I was like, Jesus Christ. Christ, you are sexy, right? It sounds silly, but how often do you say that to yourself? How often do you exalt yourself, uplift yourself, compliment yourself? How often do you insult yourself? Do you think your mind can differentiate between jest and severity? It can't. So when you jokingly say, Haha, I'm stupid, that's identity. I am blank. And what does your mind do? It'll look for things to substantiate that, to confer confirmation bias to confirm that this is indeed what you are. So I say at any opportunity, I'm gorgeous, I'm sexy, I'm indefatigable. So when people, and people try to, I said this in a prior lecture, they've tried to project their bullshit. Your tea, huh? And I say, no, 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 I'm not. I never said that. And it's not a defensiveness. It's me not choosing to assume your shitty identity that you choose for yourself. Get the fuck away from me with that. 
I'm indefatigable. Don't mistake that because I'm not going to. Next. Don't be a sugar cookie. That was one of my favorite lines from this book. Do you know why? Because in the 10X rule by Grant Cardone, you know what he says in this book? Don't be a little bitch. And people, the victims, the victims, the parasites, the critics of life in Theodore Roosevelt's man's, man in the arena. Amazing quote. What is the first thing that they do? They allocate blame. It's always, they're always involved. It's never their fault. It's always somebody else. It's always a circumstance, condition, event beyond their control. Convenient. They're a bitch. They're a little bitch. In this, the premise of don't be a sugar cookie, he puts it nicer, is life's not fair. Shit is gonna happen to you. Things happen to us all, right? Quit feeling sorry for yourself. What I loved about this book is not that when he did his parachute jumping mission drill and collided with another Navy SEAL, and then when his parachute got tangled and he went to untangle it and then ripped his cord, his pelvis shattered disconnected from his body. It wasn't when he go to the hospital and see his, fa his friend sitting there, paraplegic, who then got prosthetics later on, right? Who had to use sign language to say, I will be okay. It wasn't any of that. It was the recurring theme that of all the tragedy, of all the hardship, of all the things that he himself endured, Admiral William McRaven. He never fucking blamed anyone. He didn't blame another SEAL. He didn't blame anyone else. His fault. All the other guys in the hospital wing, they never fucking complained. They never bitched. They never moaned. Why? Because they understand that someone out there is dreaming to live out your fucking tragedy. Someone's dreaming to live out your worst day. The issue is you don't have that perspective in the forefront of your mind every day. You live in a bubble of convenience. You live in a fucking bubble of luxury. Things like depression exist in a vacuum of a very, very privileged life. Because if you had any survival, if you had any hardship, real adversity, you wouldn't have the time to bitch and moan about your own woes. You wouldn't have time to feel sorry for yourself, right? You wouldn't have these sad thoughts to entertain them, you would be too fucking busy. And when you have that right in front of you, I was driving the other day, not feeling the best. And I look to the corner of the crosswalk and I see this woman in one of those chairs where you have to use a toggle to move, not a normal wheelchair, but one of those decked out ones. How effortless was it to harbor gratitude for my fucking life when I have that right in front of me? Something that is gonna be predicated, a recurring theme in this university, is there's no victims. I don't fucking tolerate it. I don't sympathize with you, go fuck yourself. People who bitch and moan yet do nothing to change are disgusting. I don't want you anywhere near me because the thing you lack the most, severely, is perspective. Because if you saw the person who had it worse, you wouldn't be sharing them your problems. They'd trade problems with you in a fucking heartbeat. Right? But it's interesting because that's the world that we live in today are the ones who bitch and the ones who moan and they have no idea how good they have it because this generation currently, this world, it's so easy, right? And hardship, hard times will come and real men who have a foundation of trauma and hardship because that's the only way you develop character right, is you go through something so you grow because of it. You're going to see the people who have emotional stoicism, emotional control, emotional fortitude, mental prowess. You're going to see the people who not are just strong physically, mentally, spiritually, intellectually, emotionally, right, financially. You're going to see people who are leaders amongst leaders. And that's who I want everyone in this university to become. Man, is a leader amongst leaders, right? It's the person who <sighs> stands
stands up for what they believe in, even if they're standing alone. How many people do you know who, out of fear, don't say what they know is fucking true? Don't stand up for what they know is wrong, for injustice. It's a world of cowardice, man. It's a world of people who were never, who never cultivated the virtues, the very virtues that I'm trying to insist for us to consider in this university. Character, work ethic, discipline, integrity. So when I say don't be a little bitch, don't be. No one cares, especially if you're a man. Quit feeling sorry for yourself. We all go through shit. We all have our crosses to bear. No one gives a fuck. And I don't say that to put you down. It's understanding no one's coming to save you. And the sooner you learn that, the sooner you say, oh, if I want my life to improve, I have to be the hero. I have to take ownership. I have to take responsibility to improve it, to change it, to remedy my situation. Until you do, you're not going to change anything. Okay? Quit being a little bitch. I'm not going to coddle you. And I'm the one who actually loves you the most. Because the one who does you the biggest disservice is the one who coddles you. The one who says, you neglecting, you half-assing, you shortcutting, you saying good enough is okay. It's not. And it's so important that when you surround yourself with losers, and that's your standard, and that's the etiquette, you think it's normal. You think looking like shit, you think not taking any pride in your appearance, you think neglecting going to your to training, eating shitty food, you think that's okay and it's normal. Until you're in an environment of killers, of leaders, of people with class, character, and integrity, and then you realize, oh, I'm disgusting and I was surrounded by disgusting people. But because that's your current reality, you think that's normal because that's your shit standard. If you want to grow, it's in the absence of your comfort zone. You going into a place where you're forced to level up, you're forced to work harder, you're forced to be sharper, you're forced to show up correct just to compete, just to stay on the court. That's the importance of who you surround yourself with. You want to surround yourself with people who hold you accountable, the importance of the partner. You want to surround yourself with people who give you the gift of candor. Hey, you should pluck your eyebrows. Hey, you should take a shower. Hey, you look like shit. Hey, you look like a bum. That's a gift that they're giving you for you to improve, for you to iterate, for you to get better, for you to show up correct. Don't be a sugar cookie. Don't be a little bitch. Perseverance. Pay for your failures. Let it teach you and strengthen you to prepare for your journey and the battles to come. How cool is that of an idea, right? There's a good quote. I said it in a prior lecture. It's one of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite books by Alexander Dumas. It's called The Count of Monte Cristo. He said, life is a storm, my young friend. You will bask in the sunlight one, one moment, be shattered on the rocks the next. What makes you a man is what you do when that storm comes. You must look into that storm and shout as you did in Rome. Do your worst, for I will do mine. And the fates will know you as we know you. As Albert, that was his name, the man. Very important. Look into the storm and shout, do your worst, for I will do mine. What did I just say? For failure, let it teach you and let it strengthen you to prepare you for your journey, your battles to come. It's very interesting how when people say I want something, I want muscle. I want strength. God, universe, whatever you believe in, yourself. You say I want strength, you don't just get strength, right? You get, for example, in the gym. You, in order to get stronger, you need a new stimulus, right? You need to give your body a reason to be stronger. So you invite more resistance, more pain, more discomfort, and that forces you to grow and to become stronger. Interesting. When I want to make a cake, I don't just get a cake, I get all the materials for a cake, right? Get the powder, get the flour, get the eggs, sugar, everything, right? The whisk, the bowl. Interesting. When I say I want euphoric love, and then I experience heartbreak from this toxic person who I've, has been in my life. Interesting, right? Life gives you exactly what you say that you want. Exactly, it gives you all of the tools to get exactly what you say that you want. 
But people don't understand that that's the translation. So when I say failures let it teach you and strengthen you for your journey to come, if you want to be stronger, you have to go through hardship to grow. If you want to be more confident, you have to keep all your promises made to yourself for your self-trust to go up, to be more confident. If you want to have a cake, I give you all the tools, then you'll have your cake, right? When there's a good video by a priest, he said, I asked God for courage. He didn't give me courage. He gave me opportunities to be courageous. When I asked God for love, he didn't give me love. He gave me troubled people. He gave me the opportunity to love them. When I asked God for strength, he didn't give me strength. He gave me problems for me to become stronger. Do you understand that rhetoric? So the things that you're going through, there's a good quote. What if everything I'm going through right now is preparing me for a dream bigger than I can imagine? What if your hardship, your adversity, your failure, your heartbreak is God, the universe giving you exactly what you say that you want? What if that's the price tag? Something to consider. Dare greatly, have courage to pursue and to stand up to the bullies what you believe in. It's very interesting how I was in elementary school, I don't remember the year, and there was a picture. And it's important because this ties in with the whole COVID bullshit. And it said, it was a picture of all dark characters, and there was one golden character. And the caption of the little motivational poster said, stand up for what you believe in even if you're standing alone. And I remember during that, the whole mask and the whole injections and all this bullshit, I saw so many people I knew be such cowards to comply to get the injection and the injection and the booster shot and the... And I just thought, what the fuck happened to stand up for what you believe in even if you're standing alone, right? And when I saw all of that cowardice, when I saw all of that, people who would conform, all of the sheep, all the people so easily manipulated by fear, I just, I didn't understand it. And now I understand it full well. And it's two things. It's one is way more people are easily manipulated by fear than you think. And number two, when it comes down to it, we live in a world of cowardice, of fear. And it's not just fear to comply, right? And fear that I might lose my job and fear of this. It's fear of what other people think about me, right? And I remember I would get my fake passport, the you know vaccination passport to get through borders because I was traveling at the time. I remember I would do all of these little hoops and things because I was like, it was a principle for me, right? And again, perspicacity, the ability to perceive, one of the tenets of this book, to be aware, to be observant, to have that humility. As you start to ask yourself, when they incentivize you with your unalienable God-given rights, that amongst which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, when they'd say, take this and we'll let you travel again, we'll give you the freedom to liberty again, just take this. It was the principle for me that said, get fucked. Because I understand how tyranny works. You give them an inch, they'll take a mile. And then they have time. You expand the time horizon, and then you'll realize that your new norm is you're living in a state of learned helplessness, oppression, tyranny. Because what you allowed, you can't give them a fucking inch. People don't understand that. And it's cowardice. When the Jews were overtaken during the Holocaust, people always asked us why we never fought back. But it never happened all at once. It was just one of those little things. And so whenever a new thing was implemented, we just said, oh, no, no big deal. It's just a little thing until it wasn't. But people don't think, they don't observe, they don't have perspicacity, they don't have courage to challenge what they're told, they're programmed. Resist the slave mind, right? Have courage to stand up for what you believe in, which for me is freedom, even if you're standing alone. People forget that not two years ago you were living in a state of tyranny, of unconstitution. You were forced to stay in your house. You were forced to abide by a curfew. You were fined if you fucking stepped outside. You could get arrested if you didn't have that bullshit and you traveled without one. People forget so easily. Do you think that's not going to happen again? Because it will. People have very short-term memories. They're so easily distracted. And I'm not going to go down that negative rabbit hole, but just understand. Have the courage to stand up for what you believe in when you know it's bullshit. 
And that's the premise of the university, man. And these are the virtues that I'm so proud to instill because when my son watches this one day, or one of my sons, plural, maybe I have 10, these are the lessons that I want to impart. Character, integrity, what you do day in and day out when no one's watching, being a man amongst fucking children, a leader amongst leaders, right? Having the courage to stand up for what you believe in, even if you're standing alone, very important. And very few people have that courage. But for me, it's never been courageous. It's been, how do I look at myself in the mirror when I know that the only way tyranny is allowed to stand is that good men, good men stand idle. That's the only way that shit persists. Because all it takes is all the good men to say, this is bullshit, get fucked. And then we would forever live in a state of serenity and freedom. And if you don't think that's what this is all about, dude, this is all about freedom forever. And it takes courage to stand up to the bullies. Because they'll threaten you. And they'll threaten your livelihood. And they'll threaten your job security. And they'll threaten all of this. And I had this with a coworker who said, you can't talk to me like this, you can't do it. I said, I have no qualms losing my job over integrity. That's a non-negotiable for me. I said, I have no fear of getting fired speaking the truth. To finish, the power of one person to inspire the belief in those around him. One person can change the world by giving people hope. There's a story in this book where they're all in mud and they're gonna be in it for several hours and they said, you can quit at any time. We just need five of you to step out and then you'll, we'll give you some hot cocoa, you'll be warm, the pain will be over. And one person was going away. He stepped out, he was walking towards that relief and then the SEAL commander smiled because they knew that if one person quit, it would inspire doubt and fear in the other men. And then one person started to sing and the chant became one person became two, two became three until everyone was singing. And then the night became a little warmer, the wind a little less sharp, less cold, less frigid. And then they endured despite the screaming and shouting, the threats from the commander saying, we're going to give you more time. You know, we're going to take away these privileges, whatever, until that commander was smiling, right? That's the power of one fucking person to inspire courage within their men. It's the equivalent of a general in battles in the past, right? Of a commander that inspires courage in everyone who's afraid. I'll give you a good example. I don't know if you've ever seen Lord of the Rings, but in The Return of the King, when Lord Aragorn, <laughs> Aragorn is about to charge the gates of the Black Gates, right, in Mordor. <laughs> he said, I see in your eyes, and he's, he's talking to his men, the same fear that would still the heart of me, right? And he said, there's going to come a day where the hearts of men, the courage of men fails. He said, but it is not this day, right? When we forsake all bonds of fellowship, I have the whole movie memorized. <laughs> but it is not this day. <laughs> and... It's very important that one person who has the courage to stand up for what they believe in, to stand up for what they know is right, can inspire courage within others. Andrew Tate was that person for me. Greg Plitt was that person for me. Aziz Shavershian was that person for me. The ones who have the courage to say, enough. The ones who have the courage to stand up for what they believe in, even if they're standing alone. The ones that have the courage to stand up against tyranny because they know if you give them an inch, they'll take a fucking mile. The ones that understand that this isn't about this compliance here. This is about principle. This is about freedom. Freedom forever. And if you do not stand up for what you believe in, you will fall for anything. It's, you can tie religion into that facet as well. And what's interesting is all it takes is one person to inspire courage, hope, belief in all the people around you who, who are looking for that one person to lead, right? They're waiting for that person to give them courage, to give them reassurance, to give them hope, faith, belief that they're not alone, right? You have to have courage for others. 
You have to believe in yourself enough to be the person now that others will remember you for later. You have to make your fucking bed. And with that, that's it. Short, sweet, simple. Short, sweet in the sense of an hour <laughs> compared to nearly two of the other one. I hope you guys enjoyed. Rat Life University. Those are the tenets that I want you to consider. Okay? Character. Integrity. Doing what others won't so you can live a life others can't. Doing the work you know you should do when no one's watching. The daily disciplines that add up to the big things. Having the humility to take that small step. Not deeming yourself too good for that action. Right? Humble yourself. All of these little ideas. Right? Because what's going to happen is you're going to gain momentum. What's going to happen is you're, when you start to keep all of these small promises, they're going to stack, they're going to stack, they're going to stack. So when you look at yourself in the mirror and you say, I'm going to do something, there's no hesitation. You're like, of course I'm going to do it because I said I'm going to do it. That's called confidence, which is a reflection of self-trust. It's improving your standard, right? Standard of what you tolerate within yourself, standard of what you tolerate in the company that you keep, in their output, in their work ethic, and how they show up. It's all a reflection of you and your standard, okay? Discipline, consistency, patience, humility, character, integrity. With that, and the class. See you guys next time.